So hello and welcome to our webinar um, on dried urine hormone testing, getting the most bang for your patient's buck. This is a newer test at Mernivia Lab that we launched about a year ago and we are very excited about it. As many of you may already know, the 24-hour urine has been the long-standing gold standard for hormone tests, but getting your patients to comply with the 24-hour urine collection can sometimes be difficult. This dried urine test was designed to combine both the breadth and depth of the 24-hour urine hormone test by giving you the metabolites along with the time-specific advantages of saliva testing by giving you the four-point cortisol and cortisone. This method is not only more cost-effective than all the other methods, but it has a much easier collection for your patient. So uh, we're going to get going. So if you could uh, please just hold all questions until the end, and then uh, Dr. Gordon will answer them. So about Dr. Gordon, she joined us here at Mernivia Lab about a year ago. She is a naturopathic doctor and graduated from Bastyr University here in Kenmore, Washington. Um, she has been working in the field of functional laboratory medicine for over 10 years and is highly experienced in hormones and food sensitivity testing. So I'm going to hand over the mic to Dr. Gordon and uh, she will get going on today's webinar. Thank you so much, Chase, and thank you everyone for joining me today. Good morning and good afternoon. I just want to give a quick shout out to my colleague here, Dr. Larson, for helping in the creation of this uh, presentation and all its animated beauty. And she will be joining me at the end for the question and answer period. Okay, let's get started. Um, today's learning objects, objectives are to identify two key advantages of testing hormones through urine, identify three estrogen metabolites related to a woman's cancer risk, assess the four-point cortisol and cortisone response, and describe suggested starting doses of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. So you'll definitely have a takeaway that you can use in your office tomorrow morning with your patients. <clears throat> oh, and I want to apologize ahead of time. I have a bit of a cough, so my apologies for that. I really should cut, about, should cut down to one pack a day. All right, let's talk about serum, saliva, and urine, some of the advantages and disadvantages with an emphasis on the urine, the dried urine, because that's what we're going to talk about, um, the, the, the depths and the breadths of that. All right, serum testing. Serum testing has the advantage of being a relatively simple collection requiring little patient involvement, and serum testing has very well established reference ranges. Serum testing is ideal for testing peptide hormones such as FSH, LH, prolactin, fasting insulin, and sex hormone binding globulin. For steroid hormones, though, serum testing has a more limited utility. Talking about some of the disadvantages with serum testing, there's no distinction between bound and free hormone. For example, estradiol, estrone, and progesterone are reported as total hormone. And this is the combination of protein bound and free. And this can lead to misleading results. The bulk of the hormone measured in serum is protein bound. Uh, this is the biologically inactive form. The free fraction only, result, only uh, represents uh, less than 1% in circulation. With this in mind, the hormone level measured on a serum test may appear to be normal or even high normal, yet the patient could be functionally deficient. Serum tests capture only a snapshot in time of hormonal status, and this is the nature of single point testing and can be said for saliva testing as well. Hormones are secreted in a pulsatile manner, and for a single point test, it would be difficult to know whether the levels measured in serum and saliva, for that matter, represents a peak, a valley, or something in between. This can make it difficult to monitor treatment since you wouldn't really know whether today's test results was drawn at a similar point in time of hormone secretion as, say, a test done last month. 
Also, serum estriol testing is not routinely performed. Estriol is such an integral component of bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. It's a protective estrogen, and that's a good thing, and it's a good thing to measure it. Also, monitoring a patient on progesterone supplementation can be a problem. Both oral progesterone and transdermal don't raise serum progesterone levels in an appreciable magnitude, so you really have to use high doses. And for this reason, both routes of application, uh, oral and transdermal, can lead to excessive dosing beyond a therapeutic level, uh, which can carry risks. And we'll talk more about that when we get to our uh, case study. Lastly, serum testing doesn't allow for the measurement of estrogen, androgen, and adrenal metabolites. All right, saliva testing. Saliva testing has the advantage of being non-invasive. It's famously known for evaluating the circadian pattern of cortisol, which is extremely helpful in evaluating the morning cortisol rise and the overall cortisol release pattern throughout the course of a day. And Meridian Valley used to offer saliva testing for this reason. But when we introduced the dried urine hormone test last summer with the four-point cortisol and cortisone, the saliva test became obsolete and out of favor. It doesn't provide the steroid hormone metabolites, and that's a really big thing. All right, some of the uh, disadvantages of saliva as well, some of the disadvantages. For patients, saliva production can be difficult, and there are multiple restrictions on eating, drinking, chewing gum, um, brushing your teeth, um, small little micro bleeds from brushing your teeth, and your toothbrush doesn't even have to show up pink when that happens. That can result in elevated testosterone, salivary testosterone levels for up to an hour after brushing. Another disadvantage of saliva testing, can't measure peptide hormones, such as growth hormone and thyroid, and it's ineffective at monitoring a supplemented patient. It's well known that saliva measurements are affected by the use of exogenous hormones. Transdermal progesterone and testosterone, for example, can result in supraphysiologic measurements. And because of this, the patient you know, is instructed to stop their hormones anywhere from 12 to 36 hours before collecting their saliva. And this can be a problem for monitoring hormone therapy. Estrogen, for example, drops significantly within 12 hours and washes out of the system within 20. <clears throat> As with serum testing, saliva tests capture only a snapshot picture of hormonal status. And as with serum testing, uh, doesn't allow for the measurement of estrogen, androgen, and adrenal metabolites, which can severely limit its clinical utility. And this is so important. Looking at the metabolites are essential to monitor a patient on BHRT, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, and fine-tune the therapy. All right, some of the advantages of urine testing. One of the advantages of measuring hormones in the urine is that we can measure the metabolites of these steroids, and these have critical clinical implications. These metabolites tell us how the patient is using hormones. They're endogenously produced hormones or exogenously derived. Is she making excess metabolites that put her at risk for breast cancer, for example? Is she detoxifying her estrogens through methylation? Is the balance of her metabolites reflective of insulin resistance or other conditions. We'll talk more about those in our case study. Urine testing measures the combined free and conjugated form of the hormone. This combined total represents the total pool of hormone that is bioavailable in the cells in the body. Let's take a closer look at what this means using estrogen as an example. So here's our typical blood vessel. In it, you can see that the majority of estrogens, estrone, estradiol, and estriol, are tightly bound to sex hormone binding globulin, making them less bioavailable to the cells. Now the free estrogens, estrone, estradiol, and estriol, only represent a small percentage of the total circulating pool of estrogens. 
Um, these are the bioavailable estrogens used by the cell. They are the ones that bind to the estrogen receptors, the nuclear hormone receptors that then act as transcription factors, turning on and off genes in the cell. These free estrogens combined with the estrogens in the conjugated form is what's measured in the urine. And let's look at these conjugated forms. The most abundant circulating estrogen conjugates are the sulfates followed by the glucuronides, and these are easily reconverted to the free estrogens in the target cell. So as you can see, measuring both estrogen conjugates and the free estrogens gives a more accurate assessment of true bioavailable estrogen. <clears throat> okay, and more advantages of measuring hormones in the urine. Meridian Valley Lab employs both gas chromatography mass spectrometry, GCMS, and liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry, LCMSMS, to measure hormones and their metabolites in urine because different analytes eat yield different sensitivities on the instruments. For example, estrogens and their metabolites have a much lower concentration in urine compared to the adrenal hormones, and there can be quite a bit of column loss when run on the GC instrument. So LCMSMS is a better choice to maximize recovery of the estrogens. To the best of my knowledge, um, not all labs utilize a combination of these two platforms, and this could indeed affect the accuracy of their results. <clears throat> Both techniques, the GCMS and the LCMS, surpass immunoassays in analytical specificity and sensitivity, offering detection of the hormone at lower limits not reached by standard immunoassays. Other problems inherent in immunoassays include cross-reactivity, and that can impact specificity of the assay, large interassay variability, meaning you run the test today, the results don't, the, don't match the same patient's test if you run it the next day. It could yield poor test repeatability, and without a repeatable test, you don't really have a test worthy of any clinical consideration. Both the 24-hour and the dried urine hormone collection provide a more complete picture, and we offer both of these forms, a more complete picture than single-point serum and saliva tests. Here's a copy of our steroid metabolic pathway, and a copy was attached to the Webby reminder that you received uh, yesterday. I hope you've had a chance to print it out to follow along with us. So just uh, in a nutshell, just for the visual, this is what you get when you measure serum, um, hormones in serum. You get the parent compounds. Saliva gives you a little extra, gives you estriol. But this is all you get when, when the, you measure the hormones through urine. You're getting more. And unique to Meridian Valley is what's in the purple here, the 2-methoxyestradiol, the most potent anti-carcinogenic estrogen. We'll talk more about it in a minute. And the mineralocorticoids, which are essential uh, combined with the glucocorticoids to measure you know, uh, adrenal health. And here's a picture of Meridian Valley Lab in Tukula, Washington. Uh, one rainy afternoon in the Pacific Northwest. How uncommon is that? There's our team of um, our, our steroid department in the bottom right there, uh, leadership under Dr. Don and all the technicians there you can see. Meridian Valley Lab has over 30 years of research and clinical use in, of urine hormone testing. We found that this method to be the most clinically relevant because we found and our doctors as well, that it correlates well with symptoms. Having researched and validated the 24-hour urine hormone test for as long as we have, 30 years plus, it's provided a wealth of data um, that's made our dried urine hormone test clinically robust and on par with our 24-hour urine hormone test. Comparing apples to apples, both tests on the same patient will tell the same clinical story. So that gives you definitely peace of mind. So the dried urine hormone test includes the four-point cortisol and cortisone, and that allows you 
to see the circadian pattern of cortisol and cortisone, it costs less than the 24-hour urine hormone profile. It, it includes all the steroid hormone metabolites of our 24-hour collection except aldosterone, but we do have those essential mineralocorticoids that we'll talk to in a minute. The dried urine hormone test does not include uh, what's listed here. Uh, aldosterone is mentioned, growth hormone, thyroid hormones, not yet, but coming soon. Free T3 and free T4 are on their way. Oxytocin and melatonin, those two are also not included in the uh, dried urine test. Uh, the metabolite of melatonin, 6-sulfitoxy-melatonin, that is available on the dried urine, and we'll talk about it uh, in our case study when we get to that in a minute. So let's, let's get to our case study, our dried urine case study. Da -da -da. Pauline is a 54-year-old perimenopausal female. She's 5 foot 6 inches and she weighs 132 pounds. Her doctor ordered the dried urine hormone profile to get a bird's eye view of her hormonal status and she hasn't had a period in the last 11 months and she's not currently taking any hormones or supplements. As you can see, Pauline has a lot of perimenopausal-like symptoms. She's definitely a candidate for BHRT. Now, although hormone replacement therapy can begin at any time during menopause, for best long-term effects, uh, we recommend that it start for women as soon as, um, as soon at menopause as practical. Bioidentical hormone replacement therapy will not only provide immediate relief of perimenopausal symptoms for Pauline in this case, but also maintain her systemic health in the long term brain health, heart health, and bone health. Again, let's compare what you get in a serum test versus a saliva test and a urine test with regards to the estrogens because that's what we're going to talk about first with Pauline. So in serum, you get this. You get estrone and estradiol. In saliva, you get this, estrone, estradiol, and estriol. But urine gives you all of this. Not only the primary estrogens, but the phase one and phase two metabolites, the two hydroxyestrone there, and the two methoxyestrone, two methoxyestradiol, which are protective, and the uh, phase one carcinogenic metabolite, six alpha, 16 alpha hydroxyestrone and four hydroxyestrone. And you also get essential ratios, which give additional information on risk, the estrogen quotient and the methylation ratio, and the 2,16-alpha ratio. We report these out for you. Um, not all labs do that offer the dried urine test, so that's an advantage that we have. All right, let's talk about Pauline's results, starting with uh, her estrogens. A quick note about our reference ranges. Our reference ranges are adult female and male reference ranges. Uh, they represent the middle 95th percentile of test results. They are not necessarily the same as optimal ranges. The luteal phase that's used for premenopausal women who have collected their urine during the luteal phase of their menstrual cycle. Um, the luteal phase is also used as a reference range for postmenopausal women who are taking exogenous hormones. The postmenopausal reference range is used for women not taking hormones. Um, and let's see. These are the highs and low ends of the reference ranges, respectively. These bars or extenders are here to identify a patient's value that is either low or high out of the reference range. And these diamonds are the patient's values. We also report the numerical patient values. Now the analytes are inversely related to creatinine and a low creatinine um, as you can see, the micrograms per gram of creatinine there. And a low creatinine could result in a higher value than had um, Pauline in this case, than her creatinine been more within range. So that's just something to keep in mind. For Pauline, 
as she hasn't, you know, she hasn't had a period in the last 11 months, we could technically look at her values with respect to the luteal range, but it's been, you know, 11 months now since her last menses, and she's not taking any bioidentical hormones. So it may be more accurate to look at the postmenopausal range for her, but we'll look at both. And we'll start with estrone. As you can see, her value on the luteal range is low out of range, low in range on the postmenopausal range, respectively. Uh, just a little background information on this marker. Estrone is the main estrogen in the body um, that it makes postmenopausally, primarily from adipose tissue. It's a moderately potent estrogen. Uh, binds to estrogen receptor alpha, which increases cell growth. And for this reason, high levels may increase a woman's risk of breast cancer. Estrone, as you can see on the metabolic flowchart that you have beside you, is metabolized to 2-hydroxyestrone, 16-alpha-hydroxyestrone, and 4-hydroxyestrone, which we'll talk to shortly, talk about shortly. Pauline's estradiol value is less than 0.2. It's actually below the detection limit, and that's an important thing to keep in mind when we consider her ratio on the next uh, couple pages here. A little background information about estradiol. It's the most physiologically active estrogen. It binds to both estrogen receptor alpha, but it also binds to estrogen receptor beta, which decreases cell growth and increases differentiation, and that's a good thing. It rapidly converts to estrone, and it has many important functions in the body being a potent estrogen as it is. Um, just a few, it improves blood lipids, helps maintain bone structure, helps maintain memory, decreases fatigue. Pauline's estriol value, as we can see, is low out of range on the luteal phase, low in range on the postmenopausal reference range. A little background information on estriol, it's 80 times weaker than estradiol, so it has a lesser stimulatory effect. It's considered to be a protective or anti-carcinogenic estrogen. It binds to estrogen receptor beta. And as I mentioned, that decreases cell growth and increases cell differentiation. And this may be the reason that estriol helps prevent breast cancer. As you can see, if we add all those three up, <clears throat> her total estrogens are low. And that's certainly consistent with her symptoms. Let's talk about uh, Pauline's estrogen metabolites and ratios. <coughs> These values can provide insight into Pauline's estrogen-related cancer risk. A little mention about the um, extender bars for the 4-hydroxyestrone. They're green as opposed to red, and they're on the, uh, the left-hand side of the reference range. We think it's a good idea to be low on this value as it is the most potent carcinogenic estrogen metabolite, and that's why we have the green extender bars on the left-hand side of those reference ranges. For the methoxy estrogens, <clears throat> we have the green extender bars on the right-hand side of the reference ranges because we think it's a good idea to be high on these protective estrogens. It shows that the body is detoxifying, methylating out the estrogens. Pauline's 2-hydroxyestrone, low out of range on the luteal phase, low in range on the postmenopausal phase, <clears throat> postmenopausal reference range. <clears throat> Excuse me. A little background information on the 2-hydroxyestrone. It's a phase 1 liver metabolite and considered protective. It has weak estrogenic activity relative to estradiol. It's not likely to stimulate cell division or proliferation of cells in the breast or endometrium, uh, which can promote tumor growth. And it can actually bind to the estrogen receptors and block the binding of the more potent estrogen metabolite 16-alpha-hydroxyestrone. 16-alpha-hydroxyestrone for Pauline is less than 0.1, so less than the, uh, what's, uh, than the, uh, the limits of the uh, detection on the uh, instrument. 16-alpha-hydroxyestrone <clears throat> is also a phase 1 liver metabolite, but it has strong estrogenic effects. It's as potent as estradiol, and it has uh, carcinogenic-like activity. High levels are associated with an increased risk of estrogen-dependent conditions like lupus, 
uh, breast cancer. On the other hand, its strong estrogenic effects, like estradiol, uh, provides that estrogenic stimulus for maintaining bone tissue. So too much and too little is not a good thing. And as I mentioned, oh, and let's talk about her ratio. So we calculate out the ratio between these two analytes the 2-16 ratio. For Pauline, it's not calculated because their 16 alpha hydroxyesterone is less than the detection limit, and we do do the calculation when that happens. Optimal range for the 2-16 ratio is uh, between 2 and 4. A ratio less than 2 um, may indicate increased breast cancer risk. Uh, we can consider things like indole-3-carbonyl, DIM, cruciferous vegetables, uh, to push her estrogen metabolism towards the 2-hydroxyesterone and away from the 16-alpha. <clears throat> a ratio greater than 4, on the other hand, may inc indicate an increased risk for osteopenia. So basically, the significance of that ratio is really in um, the 16-alpha-hydroxyesterone. The in excess, you know, it's got that potent estrogenic effects like estradiol, so it could be proliferative uh, stimulus for, uh, for breast cancer risk. Um, when it's too low, that, you know, we don't have that stimulus, and that stimulus is also needed, you know, in, in, uh, to a to point for uh, bone support, bone health. Looking at our 4-hydroxyestrone, um, it's low, and that's a good thing. It's um, the most potent carcinogenic estrogen. It's phase 1 liver metabolite. <clears throat> I don't have the slide up, but what if you can visualize this, this 4-hydroxyestrone converts to semiquinone and quinone compounds. If you want a copy of the paper that I have gotten this information from, I'm happy to send it to you. Uh, just uh, reach out to me and ask me for the 4-hydroxyestrone paper. So this 4-hydroxyestrone converts to semiquinone and quinone compounds, and this can bind to DNA and cause addict formation and mutations, increasing cancer risk. Um, as an aside, and it's mentioned in this paper, if you'd like a copy of it, resveratrol and N-acetylcysteine can convert these quinones and semiquinone compounds back to 4-hydroxyestrone, which is a good thing. And then we can quench the 4-hydroxyestrone down the methylation pathway, magnesium, and uh, methylation support. The 2-methoxyestrogens, the phase 2 liver metabolites, these are protective, as I mentioned previously. For Pauline, these are both low in range, low out of range on the luteal phase. And overall, you can see her metabolites, phase 1 and phase 2, are trending low. So for Pauline, you know, her primary compounds, estrone, estradiol, and estriol, were low as well. So this may be a reflection of low substrate to begin with. Um, but it can also be a reflection of low methylation status and the need to support her methylation pathways with, you know, cofactors, SAMe, 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, and trimethylglycine, for example, and ruling out any underlying uh, gene mutations that may put her at a higher need for methylation support. A little more about 2-methoxyestradiol. Um, this estrogen metabolite is regarded as one of the most potent anti-carcinogenic estrogen metabolites. Um, it causes cancer cells to commit suicide uh, in the breast, in the stomach, in the ovary, in the prostate, in the bone. Um, and because of this, it can safely be used as a form of BHRT in breast cancer survivors and those at risk. This is the, the page on the report where we report out the ratios. And just for some orientation, um, this is the, um, the chart at the bottom here, these charts at the bottom here. Um, that represents the reference ranges for comparison purposes. These are the patient values. These are Pauline's values. And for Pauline, her estrogen quotient was not calculated. As you, as you recall, her estradiol uh, was lower than the detection limit. And it's too small to quantify. The estrogen quotient is simply the protective friendly estrogen, estriol, divided by the uh, combination of estrone and estradiol. And on the bottom there, you can just uh, some um, education about the estriol quotient, women with an estriol quotient greater than one 
have a higher survival rate of breast cancer and may be at a lower risk for developing breast cancer. Uh, the estrogen quotient often declines as women enter menopause. For premenopausal women, an optimal estrogen quotient uh, ideally is greater than 1.5. Higher values are generally not concerning. Uh, young cycling women typically show levels much greater than 1.5. Est uh, Pauline's um, estrogen hydroxylation status, we can see that um, comparing them to the reference range below that, we see that they're in pretty good agreement. And looking at Pauline's methylation ratio, it is trending low at 0.4. Um, ideally, we want it, as you can see, the reference range below there, I would say midpoint, 0.5 or higher. And this can definitely um, suggest uh, some need for methylation support. Um, again, considering things like acetonazolmethanine, 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, trimethylglycine, creatine as well, methyl B12. And on ruling out any underlying gene mutations that may put Pauline uh, at a higher risk for methylation support. So let's... Um, prescribe some hormones, estrogens, for Pauline. There's some rules of thumb when um, considering bioidentical hormone replacement therapy um, for women, men alike. Uh, first rule of thumb, copy nature's route of administration. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about a, bi a, a suggested dose for Pauline uh, using a bias cream. But by copying nature's route of administration, by applying a bias cream, uh, for example, to the mucosal surface of the labia majora, because that's ideal, um, you're obtaining a virtually ideal administration system. It really is the best. Not only is absorption here more complete than if you were to apply the hormone on the skin, um, but the hormones absorbed through the vaginal mucous membrane enter the very same plexus of veins that the ovaries normally empty into. And from here, the hormone is carried to Pauline's heart and lungs and distributed to all her body tissues, just as if her ovaries were actually producing them. The second rule of thumb, avoid oral estrogens. Oral estrogens carry risk. A risk of increased blood clots, stroke, gastroesophageal reflux disease, gallbladder disease, and sublingual estrogens as well. They carry similar risks um, because you can't avoid swallowing them. The other rule of thumb is to copy nature's timing. That is, applying the ovarian steroids, progesterone, and estrogens in a cyclic manner uh, with a few days break at the end of each cycle because we want to mimic Pauline's own youth, youthful cycle. So let's look at a typical prescription um, of a bioidentical hormone replacement estrogens uh, for Pauline. Based on her results, we could suggest a starting dose of a bias, which consists of 80% estriol and 20% estradiol, 1.25 milligrams in a 0.1 mil versa base cream, applied transmucosally, that is the mucosal surface of the labia majora, 0.1 mil, and that's a very small amount uh, to the mucosal surface, um, days 1 to 25, so she can apply that in the morning after her shower. Let's look at Pauline's progesterone value. Now, because of uh, its structure, progesterone itself doesn't show up in the urine. Its metabolite, pregnenediol, does. And pregnenediol is a well-established measure of progesterone levels. Pauline's level is low, out of range on the luteal. It's high in range, actually, on the postmenopausal. Um, but it, the low value is certainly consistent with her symptoms. As you can see here, symptoms, anxiety, depression. It's important to note here that um, even low levels in the uh, luteal phase for cycling women may not uh, be optimal levels. So even uh, for Pauline, who's perimenopausal, even her higher level in the postmenopausal range, it may not be a sufficient amount for her. Um, you know, and still definitely, based on her symptoms, consider uh, adding some progesterone. 
And again, the rule of thumbs for hormone replacement, copy nature's route of administration, and nature's timing. A typical starting dose for progesterone could be 50 to 100 milligrams in a 0.2 to 0.4 mil uh, cream. You can get about 25 milligrams in a 0.1 mil cream as a point of reference. And again, this would be applied transmucosally, um, the mucosal surface of the labia majora, days 1 to 25. Um, and with three to five days off at the end of the month. We may also want to complement that with an oral micronized progesterone, uh, 50 milligrams taking daily at bedtime. With regards to the oral progesterone versus the labial application, um, for anxiety, things like anxiety, stress, difficulty sleeping, the oral micronized progesterone uh, yields a high level of allopregnenolone, and this can cross the blood-brain barrier to bind to the GABA receptors, and this has a calming or soporific effect. And this is the only time uh, we recommend the use of an oral hormone is the oral progesterone to help with such symptoms. The labial application of progesterone, on the other hand, will allow Pauline to absorb the progesterone in the form she would be getting it if she was making it endogenously uh, without going through the first pass of the liver. And this is important for tissues that have progesterone receptors, which is every cell in the body. So generally, we suggest a combination of oral and labial progesterone to get max benefit and used in combination with a biased uh, to mitigate the tropic growth effects of the estrogen. I just wanted to make a quick note, uh, mention here, uh, that it, um, when supplementing with progesterone in a woman who is deficient in estrogen, or unopposed progesterone that is, that can lead to an aggravation of symptoms like weight gain, depression, fatigue, it can affect libido, it can affect her blood lipid profile, uh, lead to insulin resistance and eventual diabetes. So for this reason, we want to ensure that we're optimizing her estrogens, we're pleating her estrogens, and that they're in you know, proper balance with the progesterone. We don't want to make her in excess. And once we've initiated hormone replacement therapy, we could run a follow-up test, say in three months, reassess and adjust the doses accordingly, um, taking into consideration, of course, uh, her symptoms and improvement of. So let's talk about Pauline's um, androgen values. And first, let's compare again what you get in serum versus saliva versus urine. This is what you get in serum. Serum gives you testosterone, DHEA, which is good. Saliva gives you testosterone, DHEA as well. But urine, which is great, will give you all of this. Urine testing simply gives you more clinically relevant data to work with. For the androgens, we're looking at the 5-alpha and 5-beta androstenedione, both downstream metabolites of testosterone, and two of the metabolites of DHEA, androsterone and etocalanolone. And sometimes these metabolites are a better indicator of androgen status than the primary uh, hormones themselves. We also look at the androsterone and the etocalanolone ratio, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. A quick note about our reference ranges here for the androgens, DHEA and testosterone reference ranges are based on 18 to 35 year old, an 18, a population of 18 to 35 year olds. Uh, so they represent healthy aging, they have healthy aging reference ranges. And a quick note about DHEA, we're measuring DHEA, not DHEA sulfate here, as DHEA is the active bioavailable form of the hormone. Other labs may be measuring DHEA sulfate, so just be aware of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the problem with this is in any one person, there may not be adequate conversion to the active DHEA from DHEA sulfate when it's needed. And uh, for that reason, measuring the DHEA sulfate may not reflect their bioavailable DHEA. We see here with Pauline, her value of DHEA is low out of range. And Pauline's symptoms, um, I don't have a slide for this, but based on her questionnaire that uh, she uh, provided, and we provide a questionnaire with the kit so that we can get a, grain, a better understanding of what's going on with the patient. Uh, decreased libido, vaginal dryness, anxiety, and fatigue. Although not reported by Pauline, loss of muscle math and tone, bone loss are also suggestive of androgen deficiency. 
Her metabolites of DHEA, the next two there, androsterone and etiocholanolone, are trending low as well. And her androsterone to etiocholanolone ratio, this is a measure of 5-alpha five reduc five reductase enzyme activity. And ideally, we want to see this mid-range to low in women. Um, elevated 5-alpha reductase activity, though not seen here, uh, can be associated with hirsutism, chin hair, acne, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome in young women, and insulin resistance and obesity in both women and men. Uh, extremely low activity, 5-alpha reductase activity, could be associated with poor libido. Her testosterone is less than the detection limit. And her DHT is less than the detection limit. It's not uncommon to see in the urine of women low out of range DHT. We can get a better idea of what's going on by looking at the metabolites here, 5-alpha and 5-beta androstain diol. And these levels for Parlene, they're low in range, but they are in range. So definitely, she does have some substrate to keep these levels within range. But overall, um, we could consider some uh, androgen replacement therapy. And let's look at what that would look like for her. DHEA, we can suggest anywhere from 10 to 3 milligrams in a 0 0.1, 0 0.2 mil cream daily, um, especially as she, as she reports decreased libido and vaginal dryness that, you know, could be applied to the mucosal surface of the labia majora. Or we could try, if she doesn't want to use too many creams, uh, we could suggest a DHEA sublingually. A physiologic dose for women is anywhere from 5 to 15 milligrams daily. Testosterone, we could suggest anywhere from 0.5 to 2 milligrams in a 0.1 mil cream, again, transmucosally every other day um, or daily. A note of caution here when prescribing testo. It's important to note that um, we don't want to uh, pre replace the testosterone without optimizing her estrogen levels. Um, doing that can uh, put her at risk uh, for heart disease. Again, we could run a follow-up test in three months, reassess, and adjust doses accordingly. For the excess androgens, we just want to keep out a, a lookout for her uh, if there's uh, ch new chin or facial hair growth, uh, oily skin, acne. Her 5-alpha reductase activity was, was looking good, so this may not be an issue for her when we put her on the androgens. Uh, agitation, anger, those sorts of things. Moving on to Pauline's adrenal hormones, uh, starting with the glucocorticoids, and we'll compare again what you get with serum versus saliva and urine. Serum will give you this, just cortisol. Saliva will give you the four-point, but urine will give you all of this, not only the four-point cortisol, but cortisone. We report the cortisol-cortisone ratio. We've got the metabolites there, and we've got the... Um, mineralocorticoids on the bottom there, a useful measure of chronic or severe adrenal fatigue. Looking at Pauline's glucocorticoids, um, pregnant trial, it's not a glucocorticoid, it's a marker of a precursor going into the glucocorticoid pathway, and we look at it just as that. Does Pauline have enough substrate going into the cortisol uh, production? Her level is low in range. Cortisol and cortisone, uh, as we can see, both are within range, and they are in fair balance with each other, though cortisol is low in range. Cortisone, it's a storage form of cortisol, <coughs> and ideally, we want this to be about 30% higher than, than cortisol to provide the reserves uh, for those times of acute stress. A little uh, note here about this ratio. Um, if a high ratio, meaning more cortisol to cortisone, this can be associated with high blood pressure, and we want to keep a lookout for this uh, as um, in the elderly. Um, this is a reflection of um, decreased activity of the enzyme 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 2. It's in, def uh, in the brackets there. It converts, it's uh, primarily in the kidney, and it converts um, 
cortisol to the inactive form cortisone and the activity of that enzyme decreases as we get older so we can develop um, excess of cortisol which can bind to the mineralocorticoid receptors you know and promote hypertension that's just something to keep in mind the metabolites uh, count of the uh, cortisol account for half of the daily cortisol production by the adrenal glands and the sum of this uh, what we call the adrenal reserve, gives an indication of total cortisol production in a day. Ideally, we want this value median or high median in the reference range. <clears throat> high out of range with an elevated cortisol, not the case here, can suggest excessive cortisol secretion or stress response, which we're probably all very familiar with. Low median or low out of range or low cortisol and low cortisol can signal suboptimal cortisol secretion with decreased adrenal function, hypofunction. The elevated metabolites alone, if, if you know, it's not the case here, but if you see elevated metabolites alone, um, that could be coming from the adipose tissue, so just keep that in mind. But Pauline is not obese. Um, what we're most likely looking at uh, with Pauline here is someone who is in the adaptive phase of the, of the stress response before they begin decompensation. In other words, someone who's pushing themselves, working really hard, uh, maybe even under-reporting their level of stress. Another measure of the 5-alpha reductase activity, the 5-alpha THF and THF, and this value is pretty consistent with the previous measure, the androsterone to etoclanolone ratio, which we saw previously. And additional measures of glucocorticoid status, 11-beta hydroxyandrosterone and 11-beta hydroxyetiocholanolone. All right, let's look at Pauline's mineralocorticoids. 5-alpha um, THB in the brackets, we can see THB and THA. When low normal, these are a strong indicator of chronically reduced adrenal function. High levels could be associated with acute stress. All of Pauline's uh, mineralocoid results, as you can see here, are low in range. This, in addition to her high adrenal reserve, we're most likely looking at someone who is in the adaptive phase of stress, as I mentioned before, uh, but uh, no apparent decompensation yet. But the fact that these are in the bottom of the range, trending low, and the adrenal reserve is high out of range, shows she's adapting, but it's quite possible that she can't keep pushing herself much longer. And, you know, we got to... Uh, nip it in the bud before chronic adrenal fatigue sets in. Looking at the Pauline's four-point cortisol and cortisone, I know I'm running out of time here, my apologies. Uh, quickly, the four-point cortisol and cortisone uh, represent free cortisol and cortisone. And this, um, with this, we can evaluate morning cortisol rise and overall cortisone and cortisol release pattern. Just a point of mention as a comparison to saliva testing. In saliva, if you can visualize a saliva test in your mind there, um, the cortisol uh, is getting in saliva much quicker. It's within 30 minutes of it being produced. So the first time point on a saliva test, it peaks. That's the re reflective of that morning peak output, that morning cortisol output. In the urine, it takes longer to get into the urine anywhere from three to four hours later. And that's why we see the peak on the urine test that second morning. That's reflective of that morning cortisol peak. The first morning on the dried urine, that's reflective of what's going on overnight. <clears throat> and this is providing, you know, patient collects at the required times, which are listed on our collection instructions. Ideally, we want the second morning collection to be no more than two to three hours um, of the initial collection so that morning cortisol peak isn't missed. In interpreting the four-point cortisol cortisone, it's important to understand some additional concepts, which we'll talk about. The cortisol and cortisone values are normalized to the amount of creatinine in the urine at the time of collection. Hence, we report the creatinine values for each time point on the bottom of that graph there, that line graph. Cortisone and cortisone valve levels are inversely related to creatinine. The higher the creatinine, the lower <coughs> My apologies there. 
the higher, as I was mentioning, the higher the creatinine, the lower the cortisol and cortisone values and vice versa. And also the pattern and volume of fluid intake uh, can affect the uh, creatinine concentration. As we can see, Pauline's creatinine line graph at the bottom here, her levels are quite low, meaning that her urine is quite diluted. Uh, we do see a st steady or even hydration pattern uh, throughout the day, but her only urine is very dilute. <clears throat> and this could cause cortisol and cortisone values at each time point to be a little higher as a result. Looking at Pauline's cortisol line graph, and her cortisone graph, the data up there. Um, her line graph on the cortisol, we see that it follows the normal circadian rhythm for her, for, you know, the low overnight, peaking in the morning, declining levels from afternoon. But we see consistently low levels throughout the entire period with somewhat flat response overall. The amplitude of that second morning <clears throat> is low. And that's the time where we want to see it peak. Pauline's cortisone line graph, generally we see that the cortisone graph mirrors the cortisol graph. Pauline's uh, first morning there, that's just showing her peak at the second morning. We want to see that, the cortisol high. Um, her cortisone um, line graph, you know, the cortisone line graph generally mimics the cortisol. As you can see in Pauline's first morning, it's, she's got high cortisone, and that's reflective of the results of the previous page showing that she's got good reserves. Um, you know, she's got the reserves to convert to cortisol. So it's quite possible that some licorice in the morning, maybe a quarter teaspoon of solid extract can help her in that uh, conversion to um, give her that cortisol uh, peak uh, support in the morning. Looking at support for Pauline's adrenals, we can consider... Um, this is a protocol um, that we uh, often recommend uh, for patients with adrenal, uh, needing adrenal support. It's four grams of vitamin C every day, 4,000 international units of vitamin A every day, 250 milligrams to 1,000 milligrams of pantothenic acid twice a day. And I usually like to complement that with a good stress B complex. And chromium, 6,000 micrograms every day for a month, followed by 2,000 micrograms every day. We can also consider some uh, adaptogenic herbs for Pauline. I'm a fan of ashwagandha. Um, the doses that you see here, you know, they're on the higher side. Rhodiola, 1,500 every day, Eleutherococcus, 2 to 3 grams. Some patients don't do well on higher doses. Some patients may do better on a smaller dose, and you can get the smaller doses in combo supplements, combo formulations from your favorite supplement com company. Um, otherwise, you can get the dried herb extracts in bulk, and you can make, you know, chocolate balls to snack on, put it in your granola, things like that, or the extracts, you know, the, the, um, or the, uh, the tinctures. And let's not forget, you know, oh, glandulars. That may also be indicated, um, especially at the mineralocorticoids, mineralocorticoids being low. And then let's not forget um, meditation, you know, things like guided imagery, yoga, massage therapy, music therapy, acupuncture, and um, friends and loved ones. Looking at Pauline's melatonin metabolite, 6 sulfatoxy melatonin. Now this is the main metabolite of melatonin. It has no physiologic activity, but it's a good indicator of whole body melatonin production. It's invo involved in this body sleep-wake cycle, um, you know, and powerful antioxidant as melatonin is, this is an indication that some supplementation may be indicated, of course, starting at a small dose of anywhere from 0.3 to 5 milligrams. It's actually not uncommon to see elevated urine levels of this metabolite when a patient is supplementing at a dose of 1 milligram or greater. Elevated levels, though, um, shouldn't discourage you from recommending melatonin when it's clinically indicated. Um, just maybe cut down the dose and, you know, if there's side effects um, like drowsiness or headaches su suggestive of uh, melatonin excess. <coughs> All right, the next slide, um, yeah, and that's uh, her melatonin level metabolite. 
Okay, so I just wanted to give you quickly some visuals on some extreme situations of the four-point cortisol so you have it. Uh, this is Cheryl. She's a 51-year-old female with Cushing's disease. Um, the creatinine line graph, it's fairly steady, which is great. You know, it's representative of fairly even hydration, which is great for interpreting the data. Um, the typical circadian pattern that we want to see with cortisol and cortisone, they generally trend together. But for Cheryl, she does not have that diurnal pattern. She's lost that diurnal pattern. And this is uh, what you see in Cushing's uh, syndrome. You could also see elevated um, cortisol, cortisone metabolites, elevated to high uh, median mineral corticoid metabolites. DHEA metabolites could be high and pregnant trial. And yep, Cheryl, diagnosed with Cushing's disease. Patricia, she's a 61-year-old female um, diagnosed with uh, Addison's disease. Again, the creatinine curve line graph, we see it fairly steady, which is great for interpreting the data. Fairly low amplitude overall, low output, uh, cortisol and cortisone. They generally trend to mirror each other. The cortisone, that is, tends to mirror the cortisol. And her levels, um, low overall. She does have a little peak at night, which I thought was interesting, but low output, diagnosed with Addison's disease. Patricia. Okay, just a few pointers for collecting the urine sample on the dried urine test for best results. Dun, dun, dun. Adequate and steady hydration throughout the collection period. Avoid consuming large volumes of fluid at any one time. Um, the second morning, urine should be collected no more than two to three hours after the initial collection. And avoid supplements containing creatine the day before and during the collection period. Uh, this is Jason. He's a 37-year-old male. And uh, I put him up because I wanted to show you his creatinine line graph at the bottom there. We don't see uh, steady creatinine output. We don't, and it's probably suggestive of that he's not drinking um, evenly throughout the day. We don't have that even uh, output of creatinine because of probably his drinking habits throughout the day. And I just wanted to draw, and so interpreting his cortisol and cortisone could be affected as a result of that. So we really want to emphasize steady hydration, sipping the fluids throughout the day to allow for a more even um, output of the creatinine. In conclusion, dun, 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 uh, Meridian Valley Lab, most accurate testing available. Uh, metabolites, we offer them. Helps you make recommendations that reduce risk. We offer the most sensitive equipment uh, to measure these metabolites. We're the only ones offering two methoxyestradiol and mineralocorticoids on the dried urine test. And we have the four-point cortisol and cortisone to describe the circadian pattern. And we offer the total cortisone and cortisone measures um, on, the, uh, on the report, which, measure, which is a combination of the free and the conjugated fraction. Excellent correlation between the levels of the hormones on the test, patient symptoms, and symptom control. Reliable for guiding dosing of bioidentical hormones, including topical hormones. And over 30 plus years of history, providing results that make a big difference. Unmatched consulting and education services, unlimited consulting services. Call us up every time. And that gives you the most bang for your buck and your patients. Thank you so much. Let's uh, turn the mic now to questions. I'm just scrolling through the questions here, lots of them. Let's see. Um, will you be off oh, so the first question is, will you be offering a 30-day collection? Do you see value in doing this? This is a great question. It's under consideration. We are looking at how an extended collection period could be done in a way that we would not be cost prohibitive, uh, either for us or for the patient. As for the value of this, there certainly is.
Next question, can this test be used with someone that is taking oral contraceptive pills? Oh, that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking that. Um, you know, the contraceptive pills, um, if they are the synthetic forms, that they will suppress the body's endogenous production. And that's what we're measuring. We're measuring the endogenous production or the bioidentical production in, in bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. So the levels on the test will be low because of that suppression. And they, as they are synthetic, they won't be picked up by the, the, by the, by the instruments. So we will see lower results to no results. The next question is, this is a great webinar. Thank you. Will we have access to the PowerPoint? Absolutely. Um, if you want to reach out to me directly um, and I'll get a copy of that for hydroxyestrone paper, please do so. My email address is s as in Shalama, Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N, at meridianvalleylab.com. Or just call us up and ask for me. I'd be happy to um, share all my information with you. Uh, please post low estrogen symptom slide again. And you'll have the PowerPoint, and um, that'll be available for you. Uh, next question. If someone is using bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, BHRT, should they stop before retesting? No. The whole idea of the test for a patient on bioidentical hormone therapy is to, to uh, see how they're doing on the therapy, how they're metabolizing that. Are they pushing it towards the carcinogenic metabolites? Are they methylating enough properly? So we want to test that patient while she's on her hormones. Oh, and Dr. Larson um, uh, just mentioned, unless you're looking for a baseline, then, yeah, you'd have the patient go up the hormones. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, next question here. Which test would be most useful for PCOS patients, polycystic ovarian syndrome patients? Any of our hormone tests. Um, you'll get the 5-alpha reductase enzyme activity on uh, the, the dried urine test. Um, you'll also get the estrogen and all their metabolites. The progesterone metabolite is covered on the dried urine test as well. All the androgens, you'll get the mineralocorticoids. So whichever, I think it really boils down to whichever is convenient for your patient, whichever you want to do. A lot of doctors like the um, easy collection technique of the dried urine um, as opposed to having to carry around a three liter jug all day but it's really up to um, you know your patient which they want to do can you retest a patient with the dried test absolutely and in fact I would you know either tests are going to tell the same story of that patient but if you do a dried urine test I would recommend following up on the dried urine test um, Okay, as right as Dr. Larson just mentioned, and thank you so much. Um, if you've done a previous test on the 24-hour, you can um, follow up with a dried urine. Keeping in mind that the dried uh, the urine the reference ranges are a little different, um, but you know it's definitely um, doable. And next question here. I couldn't find the message box. You may want to explain. Hmm. Let's see. We're just reading through the questions here. There's so many <laughs> to um, to look through, and we want to get to all of them. Please post low. Okay, we so we answered that one. I guess that's it. Oh, here's a question. Should a patient stop pregnenolone and DHEA supplements before the test? Personally, I think you would want to test the patient. With my patient, I'd want to test them while taking supplements because I would want to see how it's being metabolized. 
um, and you know if that dose is, is working for them. Um, unsupplemented, you're going to get a baseline, and then you can start from scratch from there, and then put the patient back on. So you might have a washout period. It depends what you want, you know, what what you want to test the patient for. Um, but I, I I prefer the idea of uh, testing them on supplements, all on the hormones, just to see where it's going. Will Medicare pay for the dried urine test? We do not bill Medicare or Medicaid. We don't bill insurance at all. Hey, so that concludes uh, the webinar um, today. Uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to email either me or Dr. Gordon at sgordon at meridianbiolab.com, or you could just respond to the organizer of this conference or this webinar. Um, as uh, in regards to the Medicare, we do not bill insurance, but we provide the CPT codes with any uh, test that you order so they can submit it to their insurance um, and they can see anywhere from 0% reimbursement to 100% reimbursement. Uh, someone just asked what is the cost of this test? So the tests range from an estrogen profile, they start at only $100. For the most comprehensive panel that we offer, it's $225 and I know we have a lot of people up here from Canada. Uh, we have a, uh, a exchange rate guarantee if you're located in Canada. Um, you know, with down exchange rates, so you can call our customer service and get that pricing. It's guaranteed Canadian pricing in Canadian dollars. And we also have a lot of doctors here from Ontario as well. Um, and this testing can be ordered through in common laboratories uh, with the, uh, the Naturopathic Act and not being able to order outside of province laboratories. Um, but if you are attending, and if you did attend this conference and you would like to try this test, 